the um, issue I want to speak today is what does it mean to be a progressive in the 21st century? And this is a more tricky question than one would assume at first sight. And uh, Vlad asked me before uh, I came here, um, uh, will you speak today about Occupy Wall Street? And I said, no, I don't want to speak about o Occupy Wall Street. And then I said, for, but for sure, uh, implicit I'm talking about, because what um, do people think? Many people think about these protests, about these uh, movements or this mood, uh, this angry mood, um, that many people share the mood, but they say, uh, but what, uh, what are, are you, we know what you are against, but we don't know what we are in favor. And so um, what to be a pr progressive in the 21st century has to try to find an answer to that. And I um, give you, try to want to give you some hints in which direction I think one has to think. There are a lot of people in our Western societies in our Western capitalist societies or in our Western market economies. Uh, it's not so important at this point how you want to call it uh, on the wrong track. Actually, since the downward spiral in the economic and the economic uncertainties which we can observe since the slump in the financial crisis in fall 2008, most people think that there are a lot of things wrong with our societies? Frankly, how could they think differently? Not so few people would go further and say that capitalism itself is, uh, is with capitalism itself is something wrong, that capitalism doesn't have a problem, that it is the problem. And if they are not in this strang, str uh, strong sense anti, anti, they are it maybe in a softer sense. The system is principally unfair, or some others maybe would lament that the consumer society makes everything to a commodity, that everything is about money, that this undermines our social relations and relationships, all social, social spheres of society, that this makes our TV program worse, and McDonald's, McDonald's, you all know these modes of critique and I'm sure you know three or four others, other modes of critic too. But this is really paradox. One has to, has to understand this paradox. On the one hand, you have these bad moods about capitalism. On the other, other hand, you have, you know, every, everybody knows capitalism has won. This system is sad, is the winner of history. And this is for sure true in the sense that even most of the people who have a bad sentiment about this system along the word system, um, who have a bad sentiment about this system, they don't have an alternative in their pockets. They think that capitalism isn't nice, that it's unfair, that it destroys our cities and our environment and our social neighborhoods, but they don't see how to change that. You don't need too much irony to say that this kind of critic postulates capitalism is principally bad, but, you can't, but there can't be done anything about it. And now let me come to progressism. Progressism, which was in history mostly associated with people and movements or parties from the left, shared some or most elements of this critique. It shared the critique that capitalism is unfair and unjust, that it's a system of exploitation, that it gives to the privileged, and that it should be succeeded by a better system, or, or that the special actual configuration of market society was unfair and unjust, and that it should be succeeded by a more just, more equal, more stable kind of market society by curing the ills of the system. First was the program of the more radical, second the program of the more reformist strain, for example, post-war social democrats in Europe, or new dealers in the US. Both trains had in common that they were convinced that it's possible to change a bad system to a better system, or to change maybe a not good enough system to a better system. Anyway, what they had in common was, to put it simple, that this is possible, that citizens, citizens men and women, 
have it in their hand to make a change for the better to improve their societies. That there is progress in history and that there is progress in history possible. That's what gave them the name progressives. And this was not only a political program, it was also a mentality, optimism. They weren't depressed by the ills of their, soci ills of their societies. These ills inspired them and urged them, them to cure them. Martin Luther King, in front of the Lincoln Memorial, didn't say, I have a nightmare. <laughs> he said, I have a dream. If he would have said, I have a nightmare, maybe of the, uh, there wouldn't have been uh, much about the American civic movement. To be a progressive in the 21st century means first to restore this optimism and the elan which results of optimism. Second, and this is important to me, that, it's that it is possible in the framework of a capitalist market society to make it more just and fair and more equal. And, and that's important for me more than that, that this is a condition to make a market capitalist society more stable and function, functional. And at po that point, I'm at the, at the cure theme of our day, uh, the domino effect. There is a, possi uh, a possible positive domino effect to the domino effect from more equality, more wealth, more prosperity, uh, and more stable economic uh, development and a better life for more people. This is simply the point I want to make in my book, Anleitung to, zur Weltverbesserung, in English manual uh, for world improvement. A society that shares its prosperity with all its citizens also functions better economically. The economic competence of progressives consists in their understanding this. It is important and really decisive to understand that because neoliberal economists have brought into the world the thesis that says that the more freedom once one concedes to the markets, the more wealth will be created. With puffed up chests and more than a dash of arrogance, neoconservatives and free market politicians, influenced by a certain kind of economists, have insisted on their economic competence and brushed off all those who dared point out that unregulated markets not only produce social injustice, but also massive instability. The basically philosophy of that is, of this is, if anyone just follows his aggressive, egoist self-interest, this would contribute to the general public benefit, creating more wealth and prosperity. From this prosperity, albeit with an uneven, an uneven distribution, even the unprivileged would benefit thanks to the famous trickle-down effect. This was the postulation. You know, this famous trickle-down effect is a brother of Yeti. Some people are sure he exists, but he was until today never seen in history. And the postulate goes on. So if the winners would be reserved, reversed with great benefits by the markets, the losers would also be reversed, and all intentions to secure more even distributions by extra market means would shrink prosperity and growth and harm us all, also the lesser privileged. But this is not only wrong, it is actually the other way round. Chronic injustice is harmful and also economically harmful, essentially for four reasons. First, Prosperity for everyone bolsters purchasing power and domestic, domestic demand, stimulates the economy, and nothing had changed with that in an open, globalized world. Second, if all people live in materially secure conditions, then all people have, are able to develop their talents and contribute to overall prosperity, leaving people on the fringes of society so that their opportunities waste away, isn't 
only unjust. It's also inefficient. Third, if citizens get the feeling that things aren't fair, they will engage less. And four, being underprivileged is hered hereditary. Whoever is born in poverty gets a worse start in life. Children who fall behind in their first years, uh, in the first years of living, are born losers. This isn't only unjust. It also wastes the potential of people who could contribute something to wealth and prosperity. A winner takes it all. Capitalism isn't just unfair, it is economically ineffective. Those who want to gain advantage at the cost of others might be successful in the short term, but in the long run, they make us all poorer. Microeconomic thinking is beneficial only, for, only from the perspective of the individual business. If a whole national economy adopts to this logic, it leads to a dead end and a downward spiral that, makes, uh, that leaves many people worse off. Let me illustrate that, this on some points. For a small factory owner, reducing employees' salaries and producing as cheaply as possible may bring a competitive advantage. But if all factory owners did this, none of them would be happy. They all need consumers who can buy their goods. If people don't have any money, companies don't have customers. And uh, not only that, think about it. From one minute, what, was, what low wages do to an economy and what high wages do to a, an economy, economy and also to uh, the individual factory. Because every manager has to keep production costs in mind, proper wages are also an incentive for rationalization, for inventing better machines and so on. Higher wages constitute an implicit incentive for technological progress. Low wages, in contrast, are often responsible for a whole national economy falling behind. If wage, if wage dumping is permitted, productive companies with good economic management and innovative um, business models are punished in a way. They have to compete with companies that are less economically efficient and that possibly offer worse products. In Germany, and to a lesser extent also in Austria, a dangerous strategy has been pursued in recent decades. Under the influence of economically liberal doctrinaires, the upward trend in real wages has been re reversed and the low wage sector has been established. Germany, Germany's competitive position has improved in the past years by 14%, Austria's by 6%. Improved. This sounds Sounds like a good thing. Of course, it sounds like a good thing, but means nothing else than that unit labor costs in both countries have dramatically decreased in comparison to their economic partners, precisely because wages have fallen or risen more slowly in relation to increases in productivity. And the problems, or some of the problems we now see in South European Eurozone countries are a direct result of this wage dumping in Germany, in Austria. At the same time, income inequalities has, have skyrocketed. In 1987, a board member on average earned 23 times more than an employee. Than an employee. In 2007, it was 109 times more. These are the figures from Germany. The figures from the US are much, uh, uh, much more impressive. Uh, the size of the underclass has also risen sharply, increasing from 19.2% to 24.2% of the population. In all, advanced, in all advanced capitalist countries, the share of the top 1%, the share of the top 
1% of income earners had risen sharply in the last 20 years, from an average of just around 8% to 15%, but also to higher levels like 18, 90% in the US. That means the, f the top 1% of the wage earners in a population concentrate already nearly 20% of wages. But this isn't necessarily, uh, necessarily the case. In better times, in the 70s, for example, this share was 6 7% in most countries. And in the best, that means most equal countries like Sweden, it was only just around 4%. So compare 4% with 18%, both capitalist societies. So we can say for sure there is not decapitalism, there are capitalism, there are many possible capitalisms. Societies at that time were much more equal and the economy was much more stable. Prosperity was much more sustainable. The fact is that fairer distribution of wealth leads not only to more demand, but to greater economic activity. Stable prosperity results in more people having jobs and more people having good jobs. As a rule, this doesn't only mean that people receive their pay on the first of the month. It's not the only important thing to them. People are not only, people are no cash machines. This means more to them. They also learn something and are able to do something. They develop abilities and generally go through life more optimistically. In other words, fairness triggers, economic fairness triggers a series of win-win effects, while economic unfairness brings with it a series of lose-lose effects. Again, the domino effect. And we have to understand one more thing. An economy is dynamic, not static. If one allows for more just distribution and does what has not been done for a long time, namely uh, redistribute from the top to the bottom, the already generated wealth will be distributed differently. But, and this is a big but, if a national economy becomes more productive as a result of this more equal distribution, it will also become richer as a whole, so more can be distributed, meaning that the generally generated wealth will grow. In short, a dynamic society, every society, is not a zero-sum game. Not only are egalitarian societies more lifeable societies, they also are more productive. The slogan, Prosperity for All, is a guideline for a fairer distribution of wealth as well for the production of greater prosperity. Unjust societies are often more unproductive. The, they subsidize unproductive sectors through cheap production and they forego important domestic demand by failing to let the large share of the population participate in their prosperity. Instabilities in financial markets, which, as in the recent crisis, can lead to near collapse, have also a lot to do with inequality. The circle I wanted to make is complete. Let me come to my final points. If you present this argument, most of the ne uh, neoliberal mainstreamers would say, no, capitalism is unfair, but it's the most dynamic system we can imagine. They say it is principally unfair, but, and this is good so. Some diehard leftists would say something very similar, that all the ills of our contemporary Western societies show that capitalism is principally evil. They say, like the neoliberals, it is principally unfair, but they say it isn't good so. But the point is, that both of them are not right. Things aren't that simple. It is possible to make the market economy more just and in doing so, make it function more efficiently. This is the gratifying lesson to be learned from what a group 
of German economists has called good capitalism in contrast to earlier and later predatory forms. Such a capitalism cannot, however, be one in which the markets are simply left to their own devices. The financial markets, in particular, require a tight regulatory, regulatory framework. A good capitalism is not one in which the law of the jungle determines income distribution and where governments increasingly become night watchmen that save bankers when they run the system into a brick wall, but otherwise keep out of long-term investment decisions. Societies need to set ambitious goals, ambitious goals in order to manage their economies more fairly and more sustainably. And this is possible also for today. The good capitalism, which gives all the citizens a fair share with good wages and social security, which reduces inequalities and introduces a more equal distributions, its distribution and combines this with growth of wealth and more possibilities with economic dynamics and yes, also with more freedom, with the freedom to make something about your talents, to live also a good life. This good capitalism is not something which could only exist in a special period, for example, in the 50s and the 60s, and the beginning of the 70s. This basically rules didn't change. It's possible also for today. Thank you very much. <laughs>